Well, good morning, Pleasant View. How are you guys doing this morning? It is so good to have you with us in the house of the Lord. Would you please stand as we worship our God this morning? Let's celebrate that he has made us a new creation. I'm sorry. There's something wrong. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hate doing that. We're going to try that again. I thought I knew what I was talking about When I testified of your great love I was a soul on fire, there was no doubt Bible believing, saved and washed in the blood But it was until I stumbled And I made my mistakes That I could know in my soul how amazing was grace you brought me blessings out of a tragedy you turned my old song into a symphony and with your spirit living inside me i'm a new creation i'm a new creation and now i know what you were talking about Went from my head into my heart When I was broken at the bottom I found You're my healer and redeemer, Jesus That's who you are You brought me blessing out of a tragedy You turned my old song into a symphony And with your spirit living inside My soul, how amazing was grace. You brought me blessings out of a tragedy. You turned my old song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside me, I can do creation. You brought me blessings.
how great, how great is our God. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder
Thank you so much for worshiping with us. You may be seated. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to welcome you to Pleasant View. If this is your first time or first couple of times here, we want to make sure that we've had a chance to welcome you personally. There is a connection table in the lobby out here in the East Foyer. And uh, if you have not yet met someone, uh, we would love to have that happen there after the service. We have a gift for you. We'd love to hear your story and how we might become a part of it. Um, also, I do want to continue to mention that we are uh, ramping things up for VBS. So um, we have VBS coming up the last week of July, and this will be my last week announcing it for a while. You can register your child for it already. The QR code is there for you. Uh, but I'm specifically trying to, to put together our volunteer team of adults. So I will be in the lobby after the service um, and will be... Uh, accepting signups. Specifically, we're looking for people to be uh, elementary crew leaders where you will lead around a little flock of eight or so elementary kids of mixed age and make sure that they go to all the right places and have a great time and stay together and then would lead a small group discussion. So if that sounds like something you could do, I need like five or six, seven more of those and I'll be happily signing you up after the service afterwards. Also, this is Promotion Sunday, so if you have a child that's going on into the next age group for the fall, they did that this morning, and we're happy to celebrate those. And uh, along those lines, we're going to have Pastor Kevin come up and preside over a little promotion observation here. Um, thank you, Pastor Jason. Well, yes, my name is Kevin. I'm the youth and outreach pastor here, and it is my privilege to once again coming to a time of the year where we celebrate our seniors. Our seniors have uh, been amazing. Uh, it has been awesome for me to get to minister and serve with our seniors this year. In these past couple of years, it's been amazing to see the church family uh, gather around our seniors and help them to grow in their faith. And as a church family, we are excited to walk this journey with our seniors as they transition into the next stage. And we anticipate amazing things to come for each one of them. Our seniors are a blessing to our church community, and we have seen them do amazing things. We've seen our seniors serve on worship teams. We've seen our seniors go out on mission trips and serve in Costa Rica and Philadelphia. We've seen our seniors help at Vacation Bible School and be those leaders that Jason was talking about. We've seen our seniors actually make an impact in our community right here as we served at CCS. Our seniors are going on to take big steps in their journey. Their next steps include attending schools like Cedarville University, Grace College, Ethnos 360 Bible Institute, and Pensacola Christian College, just to name a few of the places that our seniors will be landing. May we as a faith community continue to encourage one another and continue to encourage the class of 2022 as they step into this new phase that God has for them. In a video that we're about to see here in just a moment, I encourage you to take a look back and just see how far our seniors have come and to celebrate God's work in their lives and God's work that you have done in their lives as well. Let's watch. Here we are on top of the stars Never thought we'd ever get this far We live for moments like this We come alive in moments like this Here we are, this is a time Like a dream coming to life We live for moments like this We come alive in moments like this But if you can't hold what a heart 
Pictures certainly can paint a story, can't they? And it's a story that we want to focus on, God's story and God's work, not only in the lives of our seniors, but in the lives of our church family and in the lives of the people in this room and online. And so we celebrate that. It's an amazing opportunity for us. At this time, we want to pray for our seniors. And a tradition that I enjoy doing is we invite our seniors to stand where they're at. So seniors, will you stand where you're at? And seniors, if you're in the gym or if you're in the branch or if you're watching online, I encourage you to stand as well. And as a faith community, I would like for us to do something they did in the church in the early days, and that is to lay hands on our students. And if you're not close enough, will you please extend a hand as well as an extension of faith for, that you have for these students and an extension of our faith and prayers that we have for our seniors. Let's pray. Father, we pray, and for each and every one of our seniors. Father, we celebrate and glorify your name at the amazing work that you have done in their lives, at the amazing grace and the amazing mercy that you have demonstrated in these years that we've had with these students. Thank you for helping our seniors to persevere to this critical milestone. I pray and ask for your blessing on their journey ahead of them. I ask that you give them wisdom when it comes to decisions that they will be making in the future years. I ask, Lord, that you will give them patience with themselves when the path seems unclear. And Lord, I ask that you will bless our seniors with grace that centers on the very person and work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we launch our seniors and we thank you for the opportunity to be a blessing to them. So in your name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. At this time, we're going to be dismissing our kids to a ministry downstairs in the basement. And all of our kids mainly know where to go. So our kids, you are dismissed. And as they're dismissed, we will transition into pastoral prayer with Dave Robertson. My wife and I moved back here from Indianapolis in 2005, and we've been teaching Sunday school ever since then. And uh, boy, I got a little bit choked up, all of those kids we've had come through. And so it's been a real blessing. This church has been a blessing to us, not only to be served, but to serve. And I also I cannot believe how fast I'm getting old. So <laughs> let's bow and pray. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. God, you tell us in your word uh, that you are great. And we know that from the words that are written down over the years, Lord, but we also know from Psalm 19 and Romans chapter 1, Lord, that your creation, the nature that we see every single day, declares knowledge about you, Father. And we are, we're accountable for that knowledge. You've revealed yourself to us through nature, Father. And, and we understand, Lord, that for every design, there's a designer. And when we see, when there's, for every piece of art, there's an artist. And so when we see your creation and your handiwork, Lord, we are to look back to you. Lord, we have so much on our hearts and minds right now, Lord. We thank you for this church and the chance to be here today. And Lord, we, we do dedicate ourselves right now, Lord, to the worship of you, the praise of you. We want to learn from your word today, God. But we also understand that we come into this morning, Lord, with emotions and experiences from this past week, Lord. And God, whatever... Whatever it is we need to release to you right now, God, we do that. Lord, we do lift up our seniors that are graduating, God, and uh, in many ways, Lord, they are leaving and transitioning from a period in their life that has, has had boundaries and bounds, Lord. They've been, they've been bound by age, and as they become adults legally, Lord, they, they, some of those boundaries are lifted. God, they've been bound in uh, you know, a school setting, Lord, and they've, they've now been released from that and, and into new areas, Lord, and for many of the seniors, um, even their living situation and uh, the, underneath the authority of, of parents, God, and that relationship changes as well. And God, is, as they have more freedom in that way, Lord, they have opportunities now to make choices and to choose and to continue to make choices and to choose. And Lord, uh, for many um, in those early years out of the house, Lord, there can be some tough decisions, um, choices uh, about what we believe. Uh, do we really believe what God's word says is true? Do we choose to live that way? And so, God, I pray for wisdom and guidance and direction for our seniors, Lord, for the people in their lives. God, I pray that they would be advised uh, well. And Lord, we just pray for their uh, protection spiritually and emotionally and physically as they go into a new stage of life. And Lord, I pray that you would help the seniors to remember that uh, you love us, God. You're gracious with us. You're tender with us. We don't have to be good enough to come to you. 
Jesus is good enough and, and we have his, his righteousness on us, Lord. And so we just pray that you would help them to remember that. Lord, for our uh, youth, especially that are still here, Lord, we know there's a missions trip coming up here in, in this summer, Lord. I pray for that trip. I pray for safety and effective ministry on that trip, Lord. We also lift up um, our T-ball ministry, God, as we are coming into the final weeks. We understand that it's been a great season. We're thankful for the weather you've blessed us with this year, God. Just pray that as that season wraps up, Lord, you would uh, use the ministry of T-ball to share the gospel with, with those in our community. Father, we dedicate ourselves to you now, Lord. I pray that you'd be with Pastor Mike, be with him as he brings the message. Help us to be attentive to the words that you would speak through him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave. And uh, did want to, for those who might be visiting today, if this is your first time or one of your first few times, my name is Mike. I am uh, one of the pastors on staff. I'm usually the one who has the opportunity to, to teach and bring the Word of God. Uh, and uh, this morning I intend to do that. I did want to share uh, a, just a brief announcement sort of by way of an update of, of our own church's response to, you know, a lot of the, the, the things that have been happening in the news lately, nationally and locally have drawn some attention to issues related to uh, pastors or church leaders committing acts of sexual impropriety with other women or minors in the church, and oftentimes, uh, unfortunately, some churches haven't handled that well, denominations haven't handled it well, either because they haven't reported when they should have, or they've covered it up, or they haven't investigated properly, and so I think a lot of churches in our community, including us, our leaders, have just said, hey, it'd be wise for us to just reevaluate what our own procedures are, and, and do our con does our congregation know what procedures there are, are, are in place, and what they should do if they have a need to report something like that. And so we, as elders, intend at our next elder meeting and, and however many it takes us to work through that issue just to reevaluate what our policies are and uh, if they need to be tweaked in any way, if they need to be updated, we just want to make sure that we're doing due diligence to that. So as we have any announcements to bring in regards to that, we will, our intention is to communicate to the congregation, uh, you know, here's, here's how you should handle that uh, to, to report that sort of a thing if, uh, uh, heaven forbid, that ever became necessary here. So just wanted to give that announcement to you. You know, um, one of the tough questions that Christians have struggled with throughout the ages, frankly, is how could God send somebody to hell? How could God judge somebody who's never even heard the gospel? People that maybe live in areas or live in places where they don't have access to the Bible or they've, they've never heard the name of Jesus, how could God rightly hold them accountable and bring judgment upon them and send them to hell? In fact, maybe, maybe you're here this morning and maybe you don't even consider yourself a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've been invited by somebody and, and you're here, um, maybe you're curious, you're interested in that, or maybe you used to believe as a child and now you're just not sure. And maybe one of the things that has caused you to sort of second guess faith in Jesus or, or being a follower of him is this very question. It just doesn't seem right. How could a God who loves everyone send people to hell that have never even heard the gospel? That just doesn't seem to fit the nature and the character of God. It seems incongruent to you. In fact, maybe you have even asked that question growing up. Maybe you got to a point and, and you wrestled with that question and you asked a, a parent or, or maybe a pastor or a Sunday school teacher and the answer you got was wholly insufficient to you. It just, it, it just didn't seem to, to suffice. Maybe you were just sort of blown off. Eh, you know, uh, just sort of, we don't ask those questions or, or they seemed like they just wanted to change the topic or maybe the answer you got was something like, well... You know, nobody deserves to go to heaven, so just anybody get to go to heaven, you know, they should be glad. And it was just sort of dismissed. Well, I think, you know, the good news for us is that this is not a question that is unique to people today. We're not the first people to ask this sort of a question. In fact, the people in the, in the Bible times wrestled with that very issue. The, the, probably the best presentation of, a, of, a, of an attempted answer to that question is by a man named Paul who wrote the book of Romans. And we're going to look at that a little bit this morning. But even way back before him, the prophet Isaiah, uh, who, who wrote sometime in the 6th and 7th century B.C., 
wrote about the issue of judgment. In fact, if you've been with us throughout the series, he wrote a lot about this issue of judgment. And he seems to have wrestled with the reality of that question, too, and, and, the, and figuring out the answer to God's judgment of everyone, including those who you know, never heard the same truths that you and I, if you're here this morning, have the opportunity to hear. Now, last week, we looked at a pretty big section in the book of Isaiah. In fact, it was about 10 full chapters. We didn't read it all, but we looked at that sort of lump of, of, of chapters together as one after the next after the next, there were sermons or oracles against various nations in the world at the time when it was written that God was planning to judge. And the prophet, prophet Isaiah was writing uh, with the, the working of the Holy Spirit to, to communicate from God to the people that God's going to judge the Egyptians. God's going to judge the Moabites. God's even going to judge his own people, the people of Israel, the people of Judah, a whole bunch of different nations were going to be judged, and he gives the basis for it. And in many ways, chapter 24 is kind of a concluding, it's part of a concluding section that just sort of lumps it all together and says, yeah, everybody's going to be judged. Uh, more or less the point that one gets as they read through all of those oracles that we looked at last week, uh, the, the conclusion that one would reach is sort of more explicitly stated in chapter 24, as he basically says the whole world is going to receive judgment from God. But here's the thesis I, I'm gonna, I intend to cover this morning. And it's, again, it's a fairly simple one. And it's this, all without exception are all without excuse. All without exception, everybody, there's not a single person who doesn't fit into that category, are all without excuse when they stand before God in judgment. That's really the point I think that Isaiah is making in Isaiah chapter 24. Everybody stands guilty before God as sinners, and nobody has an excuse to say, well, I never heard the gospel. Well, I never heard about that person, Jesus. I hope this morning as we look at, at why and how that it will become more clear if that's a question you've wrestled with. So Isaiah chapter 24, if you haven't turned there already, I'd encourage you to look there. Isaiah chapter 24, the first point uh, is kind of a point we've, we've addressed several times, uh, is that judgment is coming. And Isaiah chapter 24 sort of bookends this reality, that the reality of coming judgment is how the, the chapter starts, and it's how the chapter ends. Some, from a literary standpoint, refer to that as an inclusio, where it sort of bookends or, or puts a parenthesis around that at the very beginning, at the very end, they all kind of point you to the reality that judgment is coming. Verses 1 and following, it says, Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. And he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. The first thing that you're going to see in this chapter is that judgment, the judgment that's coming, it will be universal. It's going to be universal. It's going to include everyone. And one of the ways that that, that, that point or that truth is revealed is, is the re reiteration of the word earth that comes up over and over and over again in this chapter. In fact... 16 times in 23 verses, the word earth is used. The whole earth is going to be judged. The whole earth is going to be impacted by this judgment. And it's very poetic in how it describes it at times. It talks about the, the actual surface, the physical nature of the earth being upended and, and, and being judged. But the idea that the entire earth stands under judgment. And then verses 2 through 4, he goes on and he says, and it will be. As with the people, you could say the common people, as with the people, so with the priest. As with the slave, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the highest people of the earth languish. In other words, his point is, everybody should expect to come under the judgment of God. Everybody is susceptible to this judgment. You know, we've, we've kind of grown accustomed in our world today, and this has been true throughout the ages, is that certain people seem to be innocuous to judgment. You know, if you, if you have enough money and you can hire the right lawyer, good chance you're going to get off whether you're guilty or not. If you're a politician, good chance you're going to get off whether you're guilty of something or not. And unfortunately, as we've seen in recent weeks, you know, 
if, if you're in a position even within a church leadership and, and you're considered an important person to that church, there's a chance people might cover up for you if, even if you're guilty. And what Isaiah is saying here is when God judges, God has no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if you're a priest or if you're just the people. God doesn't give you a pass because you're a priest, and he also doesn't give you a pass because you're not a priest. Well, you know, they know the Bible. They've read it. <clears throat> they, I hold them to a high standard, but, you know, you weren't exposed to all of that teaching stuff, and, and you didn't understand, and so, no, it doesn't matter which, which side you're on in that sense. It doesn't matter if you're one of the wealthy, if you're a master, or if you're a slave. You're both going to be judged, mistress or maid, male or female. doesn't matter. There's no, you don't get a pass. Buyers or sellers, creditors or lenders. Again, whether you're economically in the wealthy category or you're in the poor category, doesn't matter. Judgment will be universal. Now, I said he kind of addresses this again at the end, and I don't have time to spend as much back here. But what's interesting in verses 21 and 22 is because he describes this judgment not just in language of, of the people that are going to be judged going to be judged, but he describes it in the language of the, the, the false gods, the demonic beings in this realm, sort of the, the, the host of evil themselves are going to be judged. Verse 21, on that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison, and after many days they will be punished. In other words, he describes the punishment of this earth in that final judgment, not only of judging kings and powerful people here on earth, but also the, the powerful ones in the heavens, the, the, the spirit beings uh, that, that make up the host of heaven, who are metaphorically here then in verse 23 described as the moon and the sun, and that the stars of heaven are oftentimes used in scripture metaphorically for spiritual beings, and that's probably what's going on there. But again, the point is just that this judgment is going to be universal. The entire world will be subject to a holy God judging it. And then related to that, and secondly, is the fact that this judgment is going to be certain. It'll be certain. It is going to happen. Verses 17 through 20 describes the judgment poetically as three things. Terror, or something that's really scary. A pit, something that people fall into. Or a snare, a trap, something that entraps them. And he says it this way in verse 17. Terror and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitants of the earth. He who flees at the sound of the terror will fall into the pit. And he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. Notice what he's saying. He says, some people might think, eh, I've got time. You know, when judgment comes, then I'll deal with it. Or, or somehow they think in their, in their cleverness, in their wisdom, they'll figure a way around it. They'll talk their way out of it. And, and these verses describe it as such that, you know, when that terror comes, when that judgment comes, the person that thinks they're going to run away and flee and get away, they're just going to fall into a pit. And then that person that thinks that, well, I'm smart enough, I'm going to figure out how to climb out of that pit. Yeah, then you're going to walk into the trap. In other words, the judgment is described in a way that you aren't going to get away. It is certain you will face it. He goes on, second half of verse, verse 18, he says, For the windows of heaven are opened, and the foundations of the earth tremble. The earth is utterly broken, the earth is split apart, the earth is violently shaken. Now, if, if you're one who's really familiar with the Old Testament and you've read from the Bible, you might read those verses and realize that sounds like the story of the flood. The windows of the heavens open to pour out the rain. The foundations of the deep or of the earth splitting open. And I think the, that Isaiah, and we're going to come back to this in a little bit, but I think the author of the, I, the prophet Isaiah is intentionally using the language of the flood because what was the story of the flood? Worldwide judgment. It's when God judged the entire world, the earth itself, for all of the sin and the wickedness of mankind. And in essence, Isaiah 24 follows the paradigm, if you would, of the flood account. Again, we'll see this more clearly in just a few moments. But, um, <clears throat> again, just as the judgment at that time was certain, and the people didn't, you know, the people in, in the days of Noah, they were, they were kind of doing their thing. Uh, many of them were mocking. They were laughing. Noah's building this big ark. He's building this big boat. He says God's going to send a bunch of rain and flood the earth. They said he was crazy and it was ridiculous, and yet it came. And there was no escaping it. They ran to the highest mountains to flee. And the waters went well over those highest mountains. 
And so there's a lot of parallels to that story and the judgment that's coming yet into the future. But then secondly, and this is where I want to spend most of my time this morning. Secondly, first of all, we looked at the fact that judgment is coming. But then secondly is sort of the basis for that judgment. I've called this point guilty as charged. Guilty as charged because Isaiah makes this point that the inhabitants of the earth are going to be judged and they deserve to be judged. We are guilty as charged. Verses 5 and 6, he says this. He says, for the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants. For they have transgressed the laws. They have violated the statutes. They have broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. It says here that the whole earth itself has been defiled by its inhabitants, specifically because they have transgressed the laws and they violated the statutes. This word here that's translated laws is the, the Hebrew word Torah. It's Torah because it's plural, but it's the, the Hebrew word Torah. And many of you are familiar with that word. The Torah became sort of the technical term that was used to describe the first five books of the Old Testament. And specifically, the laws that were in those first five books were, were considered the, the Torah of Moses, the law of Moses. Maybe in its simplest form, the Ten Commandments sort of sort, serve as the basis or the foundation of the Torah. Now, how can we say, how can God say that everyone on earth has broken or transgressed the law or the laws when all of them didn't even have the laws? Sort of my question at the beginning. How is it that, that God can say, you're guilty, and why are you guilty? Because you broke my laws. And couldn't they look back at him, at least some of them, and say, we never had your laws. I mean, there were thousands of years, minimally, before Moses came on the scene. How'd all those people be kept accountable for breaking laws that hadn't even been given to Moses yet? And then what about all of the people from other countries and nations, uh, Gentile nations at this time, very few of them would have been aware of God's laws. And so here he's talking to all the inhabitants of the world, not just the people of Israel. And he's saying, you've broken my laws, and thus you're guilty. How can the earth be guilty of breaking God's laws when many have never even heard, much less read them? Well, let me ask you a question. For, for um, our world in general, we'll just take America, we'll just take our country, our nation... Um, Last week, I believe it was, when, when uh, technically two weeks ago now, when the, that individual entered into that school and took the lives of all of those young children and a couple of teachers. People that never read the Bible, people that grew up and never heard the Bible, did they know intuitively that that was wrong, that that was evil? People that never heard from the Bible, people that never read the Bible, had never been to church, had never heard the name of Jesus, when they heard about that account, was there anybody, and I don't mean this as a joke, was there anybody who wasn't a psychopath who, who heard about that and thought to themselves, well, that was an unfortunate, amoral incident that just took place? Of course not. There's something intuitive to, the, to, to humanity that knows you murder 19 innocent elementary students, that's evil. That's wrong. We get angry inside just thinking about it. We grieve with the people who experienced it most personally, the, the parents, the siblings, aunts and uncles, grandparents, friends. Why? Because we don't need a written law to tell us that that, that was wrong. If you came home from a vacation and you had spent, you know, a week, a week and a half away and it was a great time and, and, and you and your family get home and, and, and you're just, you know, it's, it's, you know how it is when you get done with vacation. It was great being there. There's just a part of you that's happy to be home. And, and as you're ready to walk through that door, you reach down and you grab that, that, that um, doorknob and, and all of a sudden you realize that the door's not shut right. Well, what, what, what's happening here? And you kind of inspect closer and you realize someone had kicked in your door. And your mind starts racing with all of these what ifs, what, what happened, what, how'd my door get broken? And as you walk through that door, it becomes very clear, somebody broke into my house when we were gone. You immediately see some of your valuables are gone. 
There's a huge mess. And you begin to think, how am I even going to know what all's been taken? Once again, in your mind, I don't care how much Bible you have or don't have or what religious background you have or don't have, when you think about that incident, is there anybody who looks at that and says, well, this is a, a disappointing and, and, and unfortunate amoral incident that just took place here? No. I mean, you've got some choice words that come to your mind that describes whoever it was that did it. And, and they're not nice words, and they're not neutral words. They're those reprobates, those self-centered, evil, wicked people. I hope they get caught, and I hope they get punished. And, and why does that go through your mind? Because you know stealing is wrong. You know somebody just violated your private property, and they did it for selfish reasons. And selfishness is wrong. And stealing is wrong. How do you know that? You see, the point is, and Paul makes this clear in, in, uh, in Romans, we're going to jump there in a second, but God's laws are written on your heart. You don't need them written on paper and handed to you to know that they exist and to be guilty of breaking them. This is a point that the Apostle Paul makes in Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. He says, for all who have sinned without the law, they didn't have the law given to them, will also perish or be judged without the law. And all who have sinned under the law, talking now about the Jews, the Jews who had the law and they broke it, those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For when Gentiles, and he uses that term to refer to non-believers here, when non-believers who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, at least not in written form, they show that the work of the law is written on their heart. While their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. His point is, is that there are people in this world, non-believers who don't have the law. And at times they do what the law commands because it's written on their hearts. Other times they break what the law commands and they know it and they feel guilty. Because their conscience either excuses them and says, that was right. You were fine. That was not wrong what you did. And they, they feel excused internally. Or other times it accuses them. It says, you know you're guilty. You know you shouldn't have done that. You know you should have left that person alone. You know you shouldn't have sought revenge. Oh, it felt good, but you feel really, really guilty. Why? Because you broke God's law. You don't have to have that law written on paper and handed to you or chiseled onto tablets of stone and set before you. God wrote it on our hearts. It's part of what it means to say that you were created in the image of God. People, human beings, all of us created in the image of God, we have an element of God's moral fabric woven into us. We know certain things are right and wrong, and thus we know we're guilty. We don't need a written law to know that we're guilty of sin. There's an anthropologist whose name is, uh, was Clyde Cluckhone. He wrote decades ago in the Journal of Philosophy, and you know, as an anthropologist, he studied various cultures all around the world. And, and you know, if, if, in fact, this world is just sort of the byproduct of evolution, and there is no God, and God didn't create us, and people just kind of evolved, and then different cultures evolved, what you would expect and anticipate is that this idea of morality would also be something that had evolved, and it's something that changes as cultures develop, and as certain cultures sort of justify certain things, then, then the people that are born in that culture will begin to just sort of grow up with a sense that, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. We're over here. They've got a different sense of right and wrong. So you would assume, if in fact there's no God and everything's just evolved, that lots of different cultures would have lots of different cultural standards and, and, and ideas of right versus wrong. And what this secular anthropologist wrote about in the, the Journal of, Psycho of Philosophy, rather, is that actually that's not at all the case. He says this, he says, every culture has a concept of murder, distinguishing this from execution, killing in war, and other justifiable homicides. In fact, in other words, every society makes a distinction between killing and taking of innocent life versus certain forms of justifiable killing or death. The notions of incense, in incest, and other regulations upon sexual behavior. The prohibition upon untruth under defined circumstances. In other words, lying is wrong. And under defined circumstances. In other words, almost every culture understands there are nuances to the idea of are there ever exceptions to telling the truth? 
know, we, we hear the, the, ethics, the ethics professor asking that question. Well, if you're hiding Jews during the Holocaust, is it okay to lie? And I think his point is, is that every culture understands that there's a difference, a, 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 a nuance between somebody who's lying to cover up the fact that they did something wrong and someone who's trying to do something right. of restitution and reciprocity. In other words, if people have stolen something, they understand that stealing is wrong. And that when you get caught or when you feel guilty, if you want to make it right, you need to pay back. If you damage somebody else's property, it belonged to them, and you're at fault, you need to figure out how to pay, pay that back. Every culture, all throughout history, have these basic understandings of mutual obligations between parties and children. In other words, children are vulnerable. They're young. They need to be cared for. They need to be looked after. If you're an adult and you see a child, there's a certain responsibility. Every culture understands it to step in and try to protect them, particularly if you're the parent. These and many other moral concepts are altogether universal. He's just realizing and, and writing about a reality that the Bible says, and all of us know intuitively, and that is that God's law at least at a very general and basic level, has been written on the heart of every human being. And thus, when Isaiah says, you have broken God's, or you transgressed his laws, I think what he's saying is, you all know his laws. You don't need it written down for you. You know those laws, and you know that you've broken them. You are guilty as charged, because you have, in fact, violated something that you knew. Be wrong. But then he goes on in verse 5 and he, he, he says something else that's quite interesting. He says that they have broken the everlasting covenant. Now that's an in interesting thought. Well, what covenant is he talking about? An everlasting covenant? Again, he's not talking about the people of Israel or the church or believers that, that are in covenant with him. He's talking about the whole world. And he describes the whole world as in some sense being in a covenant with him and one that's everlasting. Now that term everlasting covenant comes up I want to say like eight times in the Old Testament. But when you look through them all, there's really only one occurrence that makes sense. What's he alluding to here? What's he referencing? And it comes up in Genesis chapter 9, right after the flood. Right after the flood, God reiterated the sorts of things that he said at the very beginning of creation. The very beginning of creation when, when Adam and Eve were created and he gave them very basic commands. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and and, uh, and he told them that man had been created in the image of God. And implicit in that was the, the importance and the value of human life. Well, what does he say to Noah when Noah and his family get off that ark? And, and, and in essence, you have sort of the, the renewal of that creation covenant, that re, the renewal to him. He says almost the same thing. Go, be fruitful and multiply. And remember, man has been created in the image of God. So don't take human life. Don't murder. And violence and, and, and murder against humans. I'm going to require a uh, life for a life. Even animals that take a human life need to be put down, he says. And so, in essence, it's, it's the reiteration there of the, the creation mandate, the creation covenant. And in Genesis 9, it's referred to as the everlasting covenant. In that covenant, God also makes promises to them. That's where the, sort of the rainbow comes about, where, where God promises that he's not going to destroy the whole world again in, in the, the same fashion that he did there. But the point is, Isaiah seems to be describing the whole world as guilty in the same sense that the Noahic generation was guilty before God. In the same sense that, that Adam and Eve had been given you know, a general mandate. They, God didn't write out a law for them to, to go and, and look at. They just understood certain things were wrong. Cain didn't have to be told murder was wrong when he killed his brother. He knew it. And likewise... God says from the time of Noah, again, kind of a re-beginning, up until the end of time when he judges, once again, the earth is going to stand guilty because they recognize that the God's law has been written on their hearts. They've broken it, and as such, they've broken the covenant between them and their creator. The commands that their creator, God, has placed on them on how they should live, particularly in relation to respecting human life, they have broken it. And so not only do all men stand guilty then, but secondly... All men know intuitively that one day they're going to have to give an account to God. One day they're going to have to stand before their creator and give an account to him. Back to, to, to Romans, uh, again, Paul dealing with these questions that we opened up with in chapter 1 and verse 18. He says that the wrath of God, re referring to judgment, 
God's wrath, his judgment, it is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress that truth. In other words, he says the wrath of God, it's revealed against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. We know intuitively in our hearts that we're going to have to give an account to him, that he is going to be angry over sin and that he's going to hold us to account. And because we don't like that reality, because we don't like the thought of having to give an account to God for our sin, uh, sinful humanity tends to suppress that truth. We find a way to kind of shove it down, out of sight, out of mind, not think about it, not talk about it, pretend we don't believe it. There's a, a book I'm, I'm reading right now. It's a novel called Safely Home by Randy Alcorn. And it's the, in it, he, he presents the story of a Chinese Christian man named Quan Li and a U.S. businessman named um, Ben Fielding. And they were college roommates 20 years ago, and Ben actually led Quan to the Lord. Ben was a Christian. Um, Quan Li was an exchange student, and Quan went back to China, and he became passionate about his faith and grew and grew. Ben Fielding got into business, hit it, hit it big, and kind of walked away from his faith. And so they, they kind of, they kind of uh, they unite together in China while Ben is over on a business trip. And um, anyways, as they begin to discuss, and Quan Li discovers that Ben has no longer really even really believes in this stuff, they have some, some really good interactions with each other and discussions. And in the one uh, ben makes the comment to him. He says, you know, religion seems to me to be a lot of wishful thinking anymore. And Quan Li responds to him and he says, well, actually, that's what the communists say. It is not that the communists wish that there was a God and, and that they have been convinced by the evidence that there is none. It is that they fear there is a God and therefore they reject the evidence for him. Believers comfort each other in their sufferings by the truth that there is a God. Communists comfort each other in their prosperity by the myth that there is no God. So atheism is the real wishful thinking, he says. He says, a true believer may spend a sleepless night doubting God, but what keeps a communist awake at night is his fear that there is a God. His wishful thinking is that God does not exist. For if there is no God, there is no judge, and therefore no judgment for his wickedness. But if there is a God, he knows he will not fare well before him, or that God will make demands on him he does not wish to fulfill. Perhaps this is what you fear, Ben powerful conversation between them as he challenges this man to reconsider. Is it really that you don't believe there's a God, or is it that you don't want there to be a God? Is it that the way you are living in your luxury and your self-centeredness, and again, I won't give away other parts to the, to the story, but, but um, some of the elements of the choices he had made that he felt guilty of, he didn't like the idea that maybe God was going to hold him to account for some of those decisions. And that maybe the thoughts that he had about how he planned to continue living weren't compatible with the idea of a God who put demands on him. Not only do, do we know intuitively, though, that God is going to judge the world, but historically we understand that God is going to judge the world. And I'm particularly talking about, once again, the story of the flood. Because what the flood did is it, laid an, it established a precedent. God will not tolerate evil forever. God is willing to bring large-scale devastation and judgment when people refuse to repent. And when the world grows wicked enough, God will not just sit by and do nothing. He will, in fact, judge. The Apostle Peter writes about this in his second epistle, 2 Peter chapter 3. He says this, he says, Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the, the water around the earth that was created, that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged or flooded with water and perished. Notice a couple different things it says. First of all, it says that they deliberately overlook this fact. I remember one uh, gentleman that I heard several times growing up teaching about this concept, and he said, deliberately overlook this fact, that, that's kind of like being stupid on purpose. <laughs> These 
people are stupid on purpose. And, and what is the issue that they're stupid on purpose about? He goes on to say that the world was deluged with water and perished. The fact that the world that then existed was flooded with water and perished, they're, they're intentionally ignorant of that. They don't want to acknowledge that there was a worldwide flood. Why is that? Well, we see that they, that they mock by saying, where is the promise of his coming? In other words, it's their denial that judgment for them is coming in the future. They deny, they mock the idea that the same God who would have judged the earth millennium ago will do it again. And why do they deny that judgment is coming? Because they follow their own sinful desires. They're following their own sinful desires. They want to live how they want to live. People don't like the idea of a cosmic being telling them what to do. They don't like the idea of somebody who wants to hold them account to live a certain way. And Peter says this was the spirit of his day, first century. And it continues to be the truth today. But here's the question. Is there really evidence for a worldwide flood? Or is this just the thing of mythology? Is this just the thing of, of you know, ancient mythology and legend and it's not at all uh, reality, because again, if you listen to scientists today, secular scientists today, universally, they'll deny this idea of a universal flood. Well, again, we don't have near enough time this morning to even explore a lot of the different things that Christian scientists will point out, but there's plenty of books, articles, YouTube videos where Christian scientists who have studied in their field will present strong evidence for a worldwide flood. In various books, you can find places where, where it's debated, and you can look at both sides and determine for yourself. But I just want to point out one, just one evidence for historical worldwide flood, and that is the, the, the huge number of flood legends that exist throughout all cultures, uh, throughout the history of, of uh, human civilization. Over 270 different flood legends across you know, all different cultures of the world. One guy named Dr. John Morse from the Institute for Creation Research uh, has read and researched and looked into all of these known flood legends, and then he's compared them from a mathematical standpoint to look at of, of ways in which they agree with the biblical account of Noah and the flood in Genesis. And, and here's just 11 points of comparison that, that he's drawn out that are pretty interesting. 88% uh, of all flood accounts featured a favored family like Noah and his family, that, that were chosen to escape the, the flood. Two-thirds of the stories included that this family had been forewarned about the coming flood. Two-thirds of the accounts also said that the flood was due to the sinfulness of humanity on earth. 95% of these different flood accounts say that this flood was global in scope. It wasn't just some local flood. 70% of these accounts included the survival of that chosen family by means of a boat or of an ark. Two-thirds of the accounts say that the animals were also saved or preserved in addition to the humans. Over half of the accounts, the survivors landed on the top of a mountain at the end as those waters subsided. Over a third of the accounts include that birds were sent out to try to figure out when it was safe to leave. Seven percent of the accounts mention the story of the rainbow as the promise not to send another flood, or at least include the reference to the rainbow. 13% include the survivors offering a sacrifice to the gods. And almost 10%, 10% of those stories include that it was exactly eight people who were saved in all from the flood. A lot of striking similarities between the biblical story of the flood and how God judged the world. And every, just about every culture and every civilization across the globe, in their history, they've got a story like that. Where the story of the flood, in some sense, was preserved for them. A story that included God's willingness to judge humanity because of their sin. It's almost as if God made sure this story was preserved, even in cultures where they don't have a Bible. Even in cultures where they never heard about Jesus, they've heard about the flood, if they're willing to accept it. And this leads us then to number three by way of your outline. And I've entitled this, The Party is Over. Verses 7 through 13, that's kind of how it reads. It, it describes the people on earth who had been partying. They had been drinking it up. They'd been having a great time. But when judgment comes, well, you'll read it. Verse 7, the wine mourns. The vine languishes. All the merry-hearted sigh. The mirth of the tambourines is stilled. 
The noise of the jubilant has ceased. The mirth of the lyre is stilled. No more do they drink wine with singing. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The wasted city is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one can enter. There is an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy has grown dark. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. For thus it shall be in the midst of the earth among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten at the end, or at the gleaning when the grape harvest is done. You know, you think about... Uh, College and college time for many is a time where they party a lot, and that oftentimes involves a lot of drinking and, and um, drugs and other sorts of, of things to help them party. And even with the drinking, they're oftentimes underage. Uh, and so, you know, you can imagine a scene that's, that plays out where you've got a, one of those sort of drinking parties going on, and you can think of the music playing loud and, and singing and dancing and lots of laughter and maybe playing games, uh, party games of sorts, and, and all sorts of things going on. And then, as maybe sometimes happens, uh, it, things are getting too out of hand, and one of the neighbors gets tired of the noise, and they put a little phone call into the authorities. Hey, I think there's an illegal party going on next door, and so the cops show up. Maybe there's a knock at the door. Maybe there's lights on, uh, uh, on the police car that come, but something alerts the partiers to the fact that, oh no, the authorities have arrived. And what happens? Music's off. People are darting out the doors. They're jumping in their cars. They're trying to get away as fast as they can. The party's over. The fun is over. People are trying to get away. That's kind of what I envision whenever I, each time I was reading this, and it sort of describes, oh no, the party's over. It was fun while it lasted, but now it's over. It's kind of the point that the prophet is making here, again, poetically. But those who live in rebellion against, now, they, against God, now they experience fun for a time. There was an element of fun and laughter that they experienced, but it was very temporary. Because when judgment comes, it's going to be sadness forever. And again, if we had more time, we'd look at some of what the, the scriptures say about hell. And the judgment that is promised to those who never repent. It's described as a place of punishment, torment, affliction, distress, weeping, gnashing of teeth, fire, and darkness. It is not at all described in pleasant terms. Whether you think it's literal or figurative, if it's figurative, it's describing something pretty unenjoyable. Intolerable, I would even say. But then fourthly, and this is something that, that we've kind of experienced, particularly last week, we saw it a few times in, in Isaiah's writings, is there's this reason for celebration. In the midst of all of this gloom, in the midst of all of this darkness, there's this glimmer of hope. And again, the, the, I, I entitled this series, A Light Shines, Hope in the Midst of the Darkness, because this is the sort of thing that happens so often. In the midst of all of this discussion of judgment and darkness and gloom, there's this sort of snapshot of hope, of light in the midst of the darkness. And oftentimes, it's almost like this light switches. You don't even expect it. All of a sudden, the, the, you know, the prophet's been talking doom and gloom and sadness, and all of a sudden, there's this really upbeat line. You're like, wait a minute. Did I miss something? Like, what just happened? He just switches gears without any warning. And that's what happens here. Right in the midst of all of this talk of doom and gloom, right in the middle, there's these couple of verses, verses 14 through 16, where he says, they, he doesn't even tell you who they are. They lift up their voices. They sing for joy. Over the majesty of the Lord, they shout from the west. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. In the coastlands of the sea, give glory to the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs of praise of the glory of the righteous one. There's a reason for celebration, number four. And we're not even really told explicitly what the reason for celebration is. Now, really, chapter 24 is part of chapters 24 through 27. I think they're probably part of a, a larger unit, and, and these verses kind of hint at, or they kind of introduce us to something that's going to come up, and we'll look at it next week, because this theme is expanded upon a lot. But the, as you're just reading through it, these ver you come across these verses, you're like, what's he even talking about? And you just kind of have to infer, well, he's talking about people who worship God, people who, who worship him, and, and and you have this obvious contrast with this idea of music. Whereas the music of the world is turned off. Their singing for joy is no more. Well, the singing of the righteous ones and the believers has begun. Their songs of praise goes across the whole world even. From the ends of the earth, verse 16. 
And so what we see is the sense that the judgment of God, yes, it comes. And for those who are rebelling against God, for those who have resisted him, this is going to be a horrible time. But for those who worship God, for those who have turned to him, for those, for those who have repented, for those who love the Lord, it's going to, this is going to be the beginning of something great. Their party has just begun. There's this obvious contrast. And so, again, the message of chapter 24, those who party now in rebellion against God, they will experience a painful judgment later. Those who worship God now, often with pain and persecution from evil tyrants who hate God, they will rejoice for all of eternity on an earth that will be completely emptied of all evildoers. All evildoers, those who have rejected God, those who have said no to God, those who have refused to repent, they will in judgment be removed just like at the flood. And what will be left will be those who have turned to God, those who have repented, those who have humbled themselves under him. And they will live forever on this earth in, in what will be described in chapter 25 and following as a great feast, a great party. So the challenge to us, I think, is pretty clear. The message of Isaiah 24 is meant to be a warning to the world. Again, if you're here this morning and you've never repented of your sins, you've never turned to God and said, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I have broken your laws. I have no excuse. I can't say, well, I didn't grow up in a family where, well, my parents never took me. Well, I didn't have a Bible. Well, I didn't have the opportunity to study it. Well, there's no excuses. Because we were created with a heart that pointed us to God's standard. Every one of us is a sinner. We all know intuitively that we have broken God's law, and we know from history that God will judge. But the good news is, and it's been throughout Isaiah, and it particularly comes later in the book of Isaiah, is that God, through his servant he sends, makes a way of redemption. It doesn't matter how wicked we are. It doesn't matter how evil we were. God sent his son to absorb the wrath of God on our behalf. His son Jesus came and absorbed all of the anger in God and his judgment against sin. He, had, he absorbed it all on that cross so that he could say by the, on the basis of grace and mercy to anyone who turns to me, to anyone who asks for forgiveness for that sin, anyone who says, God, I want to make Jesus my Lord and I want to follow him, that he will save them, he will wash their sins clean, and they will be among those who anticipate that time in the future, even after death, where death itself will be destroyed and done away with. Next week we'll see that. It's a great passage in Isaiah. And they will celebrate for all eternity. If you're here this morning you've never made that decision, I would invite you to do it today. I would invite you not to leave before you make that decision. You bow your head in prayer and you confess your sins to God. You ask him to become a part of your life. You ask him to, to begin to lead you and to guide your life. He will send his spirit to come and live within you and help you to live according to that law that is already in your heart. Let's pray. Father, we, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful that it provides us with warnings, provides us with comfort and hope, provides us with instruction on how to live, how not to live. It provides us with the, the, the truth of our salvation and, and then how to find that. Lord, I would pray for anyone here today that, that that is not a decision that they've yet made. Lord, whatever it is that they're working through or wrestling through in their own heart and mind, I pray that, that you would help to provide them with a sense of clarity. That, that your words planted into their heart even this morning would, would bear fruit even this week as they continue to think and, and pray about and, and have discussions with others about these truths. God, we're thankful for your son whom you sent to save each one of us who places our faith and trust in you. Be with each one now as they leave and they go home, and I know we have some open houses today and uh, opportunities and times of celebration. I pray that, that uh, we wouldn't forget in our, in our celebrations, in our, in, our, in our times of happiness as we celebrate our graduates and, and, and whatever else we're doing today, that we would not forget the soberness of the truths we heard this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.